Hello, my name is Eric Morales, and I'm a student here at Hamilton High School, and I worked on this. It is my job to introduce all the speakers here to you. My most gracious welcome, and thank you for being here. Um, I'll begin by uh, naming the pro speakers. We have uh, Ms. Pam Larry, who is uh, the self-described initial instigator and chief rabble rouser for a yes on Prop 37. She is a grandmother from Chico, California. Miss Larry literally woke up on January 20th, 2011, and decided it was her job from that day until the election this November to make sure to inform everyone about genetically modified foods. Mr. David King is the founding chair of the Seed Library of Los Angeles and gardening and horticulture instructor for UCLA Extension. Mr. King has been, I'm sorry, has been gardening since he was five and converted to organic gardening when most people still thought it was a little weird. He teaches classes about growing food for UCLA Extension and has a book, Growing Food in Southern California, coming out in the next one, two, three, six, or seven years. <laughs> Andy Schrader is Deputy of Environmental Affairs and Sustainability for Los Angeles City Councilman Paul Koretz. As one of the founding members of the Mar Vista Community Council, Andy introduced the motion instituting the popular Mar Vista Farmers Market for his successful work on marine debris legislation, including the Los Angeles Plastic Bag Ban. He received Heal the Bay's 2011 Super Healer Award. Against labeling, we have Mr. Sean Doc Basu. He has a PhD in the field of plant biotechnology and serves as assistant professor of in the Department of Biology at California State University, Northridge. Dr. Basu has published his research in numerous international scientific journals, including Science Magazine, one of the top journals in the field of life sciences. I have to turn the page. Oh, wrong turning of the page. <laughs> um, Mr. Huffman is a policy consultant and small business owner representing the no side of Prop 37. He grew up in West LA, graduating from University High School in UCLA. Mary Landau is president of the Los Angeles chapter of California Women for Agriculture. Mary has been a public school teacher for over 25 years and has been involved in agriculture education since 1995. As a concerned citizen, consumer, and mother of three college graduates, she continues to have a keen interest in raising public awareness for where our food comes from. And that should begin the evening with Ms. Larry. Um, actually, on our side, we thought that I would speak last, if that's okay. Is that all right? Okay. Sorry. Um, which one of you would like to go? I'll go. Mr. King. Surely. Thank you. It's on now. I don't really need it too close to me. I have a pretty good voice. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Hamilton High Yankees. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about Prop 37. Yes, uh, on labeling of genetically modified foods. And the first thing I want to get across to you, the, the most important thing to say tonight, is the burden of proof lies on the no side. All we have to do is show you there might be some problems, because the one thing they cannot show you is that there has been a 20 year study on what these things do to our bodies or to the environment. The 20 year study, ladies and gentlemen, is happening right here and right now with you. You did not sign up to be a lab rat, but you are. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not know, and they cannot prove, whether or not genetically modified organisms are good or bad for you. That is a simple impossibility because we need the time for the study to happen. We need proof. Everybody on that side will tell you certain things that are important and I want to tell you what those things are and why I feel they are wrong. First of all, they're going to suggest to you that we have to have genetically modified organisms in our food in order to feed the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this is wrong. 
it is not correct in the least because in this country alone, we throw away almost half of the food we produce. In this third world, most of the food that is produced is lost before it makes to market because of the inability to get the food where the people are. In this high school today, approximately 10% of the students came to school hungry. It was not because we needed any more food. It was because we have a political inability and a political lack of will to move the food to where the people are. It is not for lack of production. In the third world, it is not for lack of production. It is the lack of the transportation system to get the food to where the people are, for the most part. Yes, there are famines resulting from drought. We had a drought in our country this year. In the heart of the drought, here in the United States this last summer, no corn, no food survived at the center of the drought. GMO or otherwise. On the fringes of the drought areas though, some food did survive. Ladies and gentlemen, it was not the drought proof GMO product. It was old time uh, seeds that had been in production long before we could patent life. The student body that came to school hungry today came to school hungry in a nation that is filled with abundance. We throw away so much food, those 10% need not be hungry. We could have done that without genetically modified organisms, and we could do it in a much safer way. Currently, they will say we need GMOs because they will outproduce the old traditional agriculture, the conventional hybrids and so forth and so on. A 15 year study from our own United States Department of Agriculture concluded there was no appreciable advances in production from a genetically modified crop with the sole exception of corn that had, been ad had the added um, bacillus, bacillus thuringiensis, what is it, Bt. So there is no advance in production from genetically modified organisms. Furthermore, the tactic of genetically modifying organisms is wrong-headed. It is impractical. If you play on a team, and the team opposing you uses the same technique to try to win the game, game after game after game, you go, hmm, they're going to use that technique again. I think I'll figure out how to get around it. Anybody who's tried to grow a garden knows that nature is pretty inventive. If you use the same tactic over several million acres of soil to try to prevent a certain insect or a certain weed from getting through to hurting your crop, that weed is going to figure out, or that insect is going to figure out how to get around your one mode of operation. Consequently, we see already that with Roundup Ready crops, there are weeds they're calling super weeds. The next step they're talking about is 2,4-D. 2,4-D, one of the components of Agent Orange. That was not safe, as most of the United States servicemen that had to deal with that will tell you. So as a consequence, the idea of continually fighting with nature always ends up with more poison they're going to say, well, we've reduced the use of pesticides in our crops. They have reduced the use of some pesticides, but we see already an ever accelerating increase in the use of Roundup. Every year, more Roundup has to be used because the weeds are becoming resistant to it. Pretty soon, it will be ineffective. Then what do we do? And when 2,4-D becomes ineffective, what do we do? Do we continue to get more and more aggressive poisons on our food? I think not. I think we have to find a different way of doing this. They will tell you that 
We have got to stop hunger. We have got to fight insects. We are doing a better job of ecology. And all these are false statements. You can look these up on any, um, through any site. You can look it up in National Geographic. And the onus of proof, the burden of proof, is on them that these things are safe. There has to be study. Right now, in the Midwest, there are a number of anecdotal evidences of pigs, hogs, unable to breed after they've been fed genetically modified corn. Now, I don't have to prove to you that that happens in humans. I can merely say we don't know. Do you want to eat that? So, the consequence boils down to this. In the world today, only one, I'm sorry, only two countries have allowed the use of unidentified, genetically modified food in their markets, the United States and Canada. Labeling occurs in Euro all European nations where they allow it. So as a consequence, these companies already know how to label their food. It is not a big deal. They do it in Europe if they want a part of the market. If they want a part of our market, I suggest in California that they have a label. We need to know what is in our food. We label what's in a mattress for God's sakes. We don't eat mattresses. We eat the food. This is a fundamentally different thing. They will say these plants are the same as the other plants. Therefore, we don't need to do the studies on that. However, on one hand, they say that. On the other hand, they have a patent. If it is the same, take away the patent. If it is not the same, we want to know what is in our food. You cannot have it both ways. And that's what they're asking for. Ladies and gentlemen, the onus of proof is on them. They have to prove to you this food is safe. They cannot do that. They do not have a 20 year study. We are eating the food, not knowing what's in it. Thank you very much. I think I can tidy up. I want to just quickly tell you the company that came up with genetically modified food, Monsanto, is the same company that brought us DDT. And they said it was safe. We found out later it was not safe. They are the same company that brought us Agent Orange. They said it was safe. It was not safe. Now they want us to believe them. I can't. Can you? I'll go first. Thank you. Uh, well, Mr. King, you spent 10 minutes talking about something other than Prop 37, and you're the first speaker. Um, and the burden of proof, I think, is on the yes side because you're the proponents of the initiative to put it on the ballot. So let's talk about the burden of proof because the burden of proof is actually on the grocers. The burden of proof is on the folks selling the food, not so much manufacturing it. And if they're not in compliance, actually even if they are in compliance, the way this initiative is written, they are liable because the enforcement mechanism is not only an honor code, it is a private right of action. A private right of action is what lawyers thrive on in the state of California. These are folks like the Trevor Law, Group, Trevor Law Group you might have heard of a few years ago that go into small businesses and tell them they are going to be sued for not complying with a law they've never heard of. And if they don't pay up, they can settle for a lot less. And guess what? Small businesses, we're not talking Ralph's, we're not talking Albertsons, we're talking corner grocers now, farmers markets. They can't afford Latham and Watkins. They can't afford to have in-house counsel. It's easier for them just to settle for a few thousand dollars than spend several years on legal fees. So, yeah, I think the burden of proof is on the proponent side to actually talk about the initiative instead of talking about 
um, Agent Orange and, and stuff like that. I am speaking as someone who lives here in LA. Probably like most of you, I wish there were more health food stores. I wish we had more options to purchase health food. I wish we had more farmer's markets. I wish we had more small markets that sold organic produce than corporate chains that, that sell what, what, we, what we're all consuming, but wish we uh, had more choices. But let me, let's talk about how this is written. I brought, I brought, I thought we'd have some fun, so I brought some products. There are lots of exemptions. I wanna start by pointing out that while you talk about pigs being unable to breed after being fed GMO corn, the proponents exempted pork out of the initiative. So they're not labeled. In fact, meat is not labeled, including pet food from China. Now, you all read stories a few years ago how about dozens of pets in California were dying because they had eaten pet food manufactured in China. So let's talk about some of the other exemptions because if I'm a clerk, I'm not gonna be able to figure out what needs a label, what has been properly labeled, what isn't, and I might get my boss sued. So let's start with this. Who drinks soy milk in here? Label or no label? Label. Here's milk from Ralph's, not organic. Need a label or not? It's from cows. Label? Label. Label. No label. Soy label. Cow's milk? No label. I don't know. I mean, I, it's, for me as a parent, I'm interested. Excuse me. Code of conduct says you can't speak over me. Well, I remember you from last time, too. Don't worry, you'll get your chance. When I buy milk, and my kids are gonna drink it, I'm interested to know if these cows have been injected with growth hormones and other chemicals, but that's not in the initiative. Instead, soy milk has to be labeled. Most soy milk manufacturers are small businesses. They're not giant collaboratives that can afford labeling so easily. Okay, here's some more products we eat at home. We call it fake bacon and fake sausage. Kids eat this every morning. Who else buys this from Trader Joe's morning? Yeah, good, yeah, me too. Okay, but it's not made from meat, it's made from soy. Label or no label? Label. Needs a label. How about a Slim Jim? <laughs> Slim Jim. I, I will give this to whomever, well, actually I'm gonna use for the next, the next event. There's a lot of products in here, mostly meat. I'm not sure if it needs a label or not, but meat does. How about this? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. So you could be a corporation that contributes millions of dollars to groups that are fighting same-sex marriage in California, but they could sell their meat here without having to label it. By the way, is there a gay and lesbian group here on campus? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, am, I spend about $5 on a Chick-fil-A sandwich. I'm going to contribute $5. To offset that to the lesbian group, please take this to. I'll take it. Thank you. Okay, how about this one? Jamba juice purchased at the market. Is juice exempt? Does juice have to be labeled? Yes. Juice has to be labeled. How about alcohol? I didn't bring alcohol with me. Alcohol does not. What's the bigger health hazard? Alcohol or jamba juice or fruit juice? But what if you buy this at jamba juice, not at the market? No label at Jamba Juice, Ralph's need a label. Explain that one. Um, I have some more, but I'm gonna wait till later and, um, and, we'll, and we'll have some more fun with this. The point is, this initiative, and by the way, initiatives cannot be amended. Once the voters pass it, the legislature can't touch it. Only the voters can amend an initiative once it's been, been passed. So you have to read this carefully. This isn't an initiative that's one sentence that, that all food that's been, been genetically modified needs to be labeled. It's six pages of exemptions and how it's gonna be enforced. So if you're a small business owner, or you operate a farmer's market, or you're a nonprofit that operates a farmer's market, you will be at risk. And if you don't believe me, look at the people who filed this petition, Secretary of State, who make a living suing large corporations, small businesses, and nonprofits for not being in compliance with random laws that, that most of us haven't heard of. And by the way, 
All that money doesn't go to nonprofits. Most of it goes into lawyers' pockets. That's who the proponents chose to write this initiative and file it for them. And I'll bet these guys are salivating at the opportunity to play gotcha with small businesses. They're not health food proponents. They're not organic gardeners at home. They're trial lawyers. They make millions of dollars every year with these types of lawsuits. Uh, we'll have more time to discuss this. I encourage questions. And uh, I think I'm going to stop a little short of 10 minutes, but uh, look forward to a robust discussion. So, uh, so I'll get into the, the scare tactics and confusion that the other side is, is purveying like most of what he said uh, in a little bit. But first, I want to acknowledge and thank the students of Hamilton High School for organizing this night. My boss, Los Angeles City Council Member Paul Koretz, actually went to Hamilton High School. Uh, more years ago probably than I'm allowed to say. But uh, he's thrilled that you students are, are engaged so completely in public policy and on an issue that is so important to him, labeling genetically modified food. It's so important to him that a few weeks ago he introduced a resolution to the Los Angeles City Council supporting Proposition 37. I also want to thank, I also want to thank and acknowledge Pam Larry for launching the GMO labeling proposition in California. It takes guts to stand up to such an enormous, well-funded, lawsuit-prone, bullying industry. These guys are nice guys, and that's what they're gonna send out to talk to you. But make no mistake, this is really a big bullying industry. And Pam Larry woke up one day on her own and said, you know what? Somebody needs to do something, it's gonna be me. And she did something. And right now, the entire state of California is gonna vote on it. That's pretty amazing for one person. <laughs> this is what a healthy democracy is about. When your federal, state, or local government cannot or will not protect you or your rights, it's up to you, it's up to us at a local level, Never forget, you are your government. So this issue is also close to my heart. As a council member, as was mentioned earlier, as a council member on the Mar Vista Community Council back in 2003, in the early days of genetically modified foods, I instituted the Mar Vista Farmer's Market. So that my friends, my neighbors would have a choice, would have easy access to organic food. So that they could get food from farmers they know, from farmers they trust, Farmers they can look in the eye and talk to, not a bunch of boxes in the grocery store that may or may not be telling them the whole truth. That's all Proposition 37 is. It's transparency, it's consumer choice, period. I have the right to know what's in the food I'm eating, period. This is a thing we do at least three times a day, probably five times a day, maybe six before bed. The more someone tries to keep that information from me, the more I wonder what they're trying to hide. If there's nothing wrong with genetically modified organisms, why not celebrate it instead of hide it? The opposition to GMO labeling keeps throwing out everything they can think of to confuse people. These are the same people who told us that DDT and PCBs and Agent Orange are safe. They're not. And they've stacked the deck. Michael Taylor, the Deputy Commissioner for Foods at the FDA, used to work for Monsanto, one of the biggest producers of GMO seeds. Of course he's telling us that GMO food products are safe. He's got skin in the game. That's a huge conflict of interest. There are very few people in the world who are qualified to examine whether or not genetically engineered foods are affecting our health in the long term, and the simple truth is most of them either work in highly paid jobs for the very same companies who profit from the sales of genetically modified foods, or they're paid by those companies to write studies intended to confuse everyone. And it's always, always on PowerPoint. Again, huge conflict of interest. They're taking pages out of the cigarette industry's playbook, scare tactics, lies, and confusion. 
it's essential, especially for the students, to know how to recognize the tactics that they use. Scare tactics, lies, and confusion. You can read how they do it right here. Merchants of doubt, cigarettes are good for you. Not. Every week as we get closer to the November election, you will hear worse and worse, worse things about Proposition 37 from every direction imaginable. From the internet, from the radio, and especially from television. What I want you to think about is this. This is big, spunny, big money being spent to take away your power, to take away your freedom. They are spending millions of dollars to take away your freedom to know what's in your food. Never, never, never let anyone take away your power. Never. If you want to believe them, you can. Personally, I do not. I don't want to eat genetically engineered food products. Period. That's my right. In 2004, Congress approved the Food Allergen Act, which called for the labeling of soy, peanuts, and other possible allergens. We've all seen the signs made on equipment that may have once touched peanuts. The very same companies against labeling GMOs complained about labeling back then. But guess what? They complied. The sky didn't fall. They labeled their products accordingly, and prices didn't go up, just like now. When all the countries of Europe began labeling GM, GMO foods over 10 years ago, prices did not go up. Again, scare tactic. Why would the United States lag behind Europe and China and Russia, who all already label GMO food products? Why would they have more freedom to know what's in their food than us? From where I stand, that's just plain wrong. That's not the country I grew up in. The industry is fighting labeling so hard because they're afraid people will not buy genetically engineered foods. If they're selling a product nobody wants, they're gonna have to change their business practices, just like any other company. That's how you do business in the United States of America. This proposition doesn't ban the sale of genetically engineered foods. It simply lets us know what we're eating. Our free market economy is based on informed consumer choice, no matter which side of the aisle you're from. One of the most conservative members of the Los Angeles City Council seconded Councilmember Coretz's resolution of support. With Proposition 37, if the public wants to purchase <coughs> genetically engineered food products, they still can. More importantly, if people want to avoid them, they can. I know, I don't want to eat something that creates its own pesticide. If I can leave you with one thought, it's this. Information equals education. Education equals knowledge. Knowledge equals power. By keeping us away from the knowledge of what is in the food we eat, corporations and government bureaucrats have taken away our power. Proposition 37 is how we take it back. Thank you. I first would like to say thank you for inviting me here. And as you know, I'm a teacher. And to any students who are interested in pursuing a bachelor's degree at Cal State Northridge, please send me an email. <laughs> um, my perspective of um, this whole discussion will be very different than all other panelists. I will present a view of a professor, view of a scientist, a view of a researcher who is working in this field for the past 15 years. I completed my PhD in plant biotechnology from the University of Rhode Island and currently a professor of biology at Cal State Northridge. For the first few slides, I'm going to talk about my, um, my research interest in plant biotechnology and then we'll go uh, about labeling issues and other issues of GMO. So my main research in my lab is use of biotechnology for production of alternative fuels. In, uh, in particular, my students produce diesel-like fuel molecules in genetically modified algae and other non-food plants in the lab. I start with a quotation of Rudolf Diesel, who invented diesel engine. In 100 years ago, he proposed that one day will come when vegetable oils, such as engine fuels, may, may, may become insignificant today. But one day, they will be very powerful and they will be as comparable to coal and tar products. So he had a vision that one day will come when vegetable oils could be used as uh, part of your uh, fuel, which could be used in the gas tank. So why use biotechnology to produce biofuels? They are homegrown, 
And fossil fuels, they are non-renewable. Uh, and of course, uh, they are, cannot be compared with solar power or wind power. They are non-renewable. Tremendous dependence on foreign oil and ethanol has low toxicity and biodegradable. And we can reduce greenhouse gas. Biofuels, um, it's one of the tools in the toolbox that could be used uh, by using biotechnology. It's not the answer to the solution of world energy crisis. And Energy Independence Act of 2007 mandates us to require 36 billion gallons of biofuel by the year 2022. So you guys already know there are three generations of biofuels that are available in the market. One is first generation biofuel by corn-based um, ethanol. Second generation biofuel, which you don't have to use the food crops, you can use any plant part. Third generation biofuel is from algae. In particular, my lab uses biotechnology to produce biofuel in cells. Um, diesel tree is a type of tree that grows in Brazil. And in my lab, we have used a genomic library and made a genetic database of this diesel tree and express these genes in other plants, genetically modified other plants, to produce fuel or diesel-like molecules. Uh, this work was featured in various news channels, and my current goal at CSUN is how we can produce long-chain hydrocarbons in plants so that you can do trans-esterification of these plant oils to make biodiesel. So also we are working um, on developing an enzyme that will ultimately break down the plant cell wall to make uh, lots of sugar, which you can ferment and ultimately add to your gas tank. Next, we worked on cyanobacteria, which is an algae, and produced terpenes-like molecule, which is nothing but biofuel, or which also can be used as biodiesel. Last part, I would like to talk about public perception of biotechnology. To label or not to label. So what is biotechnology exactly? Even if you ask the definition to general public, I would really doubt someone can define the exact meaning of biotechnology. What is a gene? If you ask the general public, they will say, I don't want to eat a product with a gene. Do you know that all products have genes? There is nothing like GM or non-GM product. So what, how the crops that we are eating today, we have, we have genetically modified them, no matter what. Without a PhD in biotechnology, humans have selected the genes which are elite qualities and crossed for the past 10,000 years. So 10,000 years of selection has given rise to the uh, plant, for example, corn. In traditional plant breeding, what you do is you cross two lines of plants. And remember, we are doing it for the past 10,000 years. So you have line one, you cross that in line two, and then you get your desired plants. Now the question is, um, isn't it biotechnology? We are, we are reshuffling genes. And the disadvantage of this technology is, when you are crossing the unwanted genes, the genes that you don't want in your population, automatically get crossed. You don't have a choice. What is plant biotechnology? You take one gene at a time, and transfer the gene to your favorite organism. Let's say it's a plant. So now you are getting rid of all the genes that cause harm to you instead of doing any good to you. So it's more precise technology, which is plant biotechnology. Question is, we talk about natural food. What is natural? Is taking live vaccine, is it natural? Flying, open heart surgery, are all these natural? What about the corn that you are eating today? Did you all know that corn never existed? It came from a tiny plant known as Teosinte to thousands of years of selective breeding. Again, without a PhD in biotechnology, we did that. We produced corn plant. It has nothing, no similarities whatsoever. Look at this plant on your left. This is the ancestor of a corn plant known as Teosinte. No similarities at all. We have gone through selective breeding of thousands of years and chose the year size, which saved millions of lives from hunger. The apples that you are buying in grocery store, you may think that you are buying, buying them normal, or sorry, they are natural, but believe it or not, they again, they were produced thousands of years of selective breeding. There was no way we had greenish red, reddish green, only green, only red apples in the grocery store 10,000 years ago. Who genetically modified that? We did. We chose them, we chose the elite qualities of genes and it crossed them. And we have now thousands of varieties of apples in the grocery store. 
10 billion people will be uh, on this planet by year 2050. 800 million suffer from chronic hunger. 200 million of them are children. What's the solution? There is no, no individual solution. Biotechnology is not a miracle. It's not going to cure, not going to solve world hunger overnight. However, it's one of the tools that's available in your toolbox. This is hot of the press. I don't know whether you know it or not. Doctors in Stanford University just published a paper which shows that the organic foods are no nutritious compared to the other foods that we're buying from the grocery store. Hot of the press, scientists from University of Cambridge and University of Oxford just published a paper It shows that organic crops which are produced, instead of doing any benefits to the environment, it can cause more harm. If you don't want to know more about these journals, go and read Annals of Internal Medicine or Journal of Environmental Management. This was just published. I would like to talk about genetically modified food and how it can solve or how it can address the issue of night blindness in the developing countries, for example, my home country, India, where I was born and brought up. Dr. Ingo Potraikas in Switzerland developed a rice we call, and he named it golden rice. The reason he named it golden rice because he cloned a gene from daffodil which synthesized vitamin A. Vitamin A deficiency is a major cause of night blindness in the kids in the developing countries. In the US, rice is not the main food that we consume, but in India, China, Philippines, everywhere, Philippines, everywhere, rice is the main food. And the whole idea is that if, you, if children in this country consume genetically modified golden rice, which, is, which has high vitamin A content, it may address the issue of night blindness. Nobel laureate Norman Borla, who was the uh, father of Green Revolution, who was awarded a Nobel Prize, for developing a wheat cultivar or wheat variety which saved lives of millions of people in Southeast Asia. Dr. Borla mentioned that in crop improvement, we need to apply both conventional breeding and biotechnology. The tools of genetic engineering, if scientists are permitted to use them, can permit accelerated development of food varieties. Dr. Borla never received any funding from Monsanto. He is not a spokesperson of Monsanto. He was a professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So question is, um, to level or not to level? So is it natural? So that means the products that we are not eating, um, that's not genetically modified natural, you decide. So the other crops are pesticide residues, should we level for that? What about lawsuits that he just mentioned? More paper on and red tape. So biotechnology has tremendous power and we have just seen the beginning of the success. And the best is yet to come. Thank you. to give a little preamble here. I'm half Italian, so I get kind of intense. So I just wanted to let you know that, that if my arms start flailing and stuff like that, I'm not angry, I'm just being myself. So let's talk about Prop 37. First thing I'd like to talk about is exemptions um, and why uh, they prove that we really need the labels, okay? What I like to ask people when you think about the exemptions is this, a couple things. This is such a monumental thing that we're doing. We are coming up against some of the largest monolithic you know, entities that exist on the planet that are in cahoots with government, okay? So just like with, remember those of us who are a little older can remember times when, we, when I used to smoke uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago, we used to light up in a restaurant, okay? In between courses in our meal. And then we used to smoke on planes. We used to do all sorts of stuff like that. But now, do you see smoking going on anywhere? No, it was a gradual process, okay? This is so monumental that we had to focus and keep it very targeted and very specific, and we chose to focus on foods that are purchased in the place where they're mostly purchased, which is a grocery store. So once you start understanding that, you can understand a lot of the exemptions. Um, why is soy milk? Uh, need to be labeled in regular milk does not because soybeans are genetically engineered not by hybridization um, they're by this very specific uh, definition of genetic engineering which is very specifically laid out in the ballot initiative it's not a hybrid it's not a selective breeding it's not even marker assisted selection it's a very specific process about, called transgenics or cisgenics where it's rec recombinant DNA you can go read the initiative it's on the Secretary of State's site Okay, 
So soybeans are genetically engineered. Newsflash, cows and meat are not yet, okay? <laughs> They're in development, so you might wanna know that. For instance, coming up next, we have news that this is coming, is genetically engineered salmon, okay? Um, the professor there talked about how we've been doing these things for centuries without a PhD. He's right. This stuff requires a PhD. Nowhere in nature do you have an Atlantic salmon which crosses with a Chinook salmon and a completely different species called an ocean pout, which looks like an eel, to create a salmon which grows three times the size that it's supposed to. This is not natural. This is not something that can happen outside of a laboratory, folks. This is a very, very different process. Now, is it good or bad? That's not for this ballot initiative to decide, okay? This is simply about our right to know what's in our food so that we can make the decisions for ourselves. And I personally started this because I got pissed off that some few people, elitists, decided what was good and what wasn't good and what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing and then convinced some government officials that we should be doing that and then decided, well, we're just gonna hide it from people and now we have to buy this stuff without knowing where it is. This is the grandma from Chico, just speaking it as it is, okay. Um, our opposition said, you know, groceries would be the final, you know, uh, people responsible. Possibly, yeah, for the stuff that they have to label, which is right now, the only thing they would have to label is the new sweet corn that's out there that's BT resistant for the first time uh, in your produce uh, aisles, particularly at Walmart. We're gonna be at Walmart tomorrow. Those who, we are inviting everybody to come and ask Walmart to please label the genetically engineered uh, corn and alert people. Um, there'd be about the papaya, which is from Hawaii. There's a little bit of zucchini and a little bit of crookneck squash. Right now, that's what grocers have to, have to label. Other than that, they, uh, the, it's the manufacturer's responsibility, and all the grocer has to have is the same thing anybody else has in the chain, which is an affidavit or a statement or something that says, the person who gave this to me, the person who sold this to me, to me says that it's not genetically engineered. That's it. I mean, it's not this big, huge, scary thing like they're out there trying to make it seem. And guess what the label has to say? It says, does contain genetically engineered ingredients or may contain genetically engineered ingredients. I mean, how benign is that? I mean, really, if anything, we wish that it was stronger because we would like to know what's genetically engineered and where. Okay, uh, what else did he have? Uh, the soy thing, again, I think I've talked, oh, the animal thing. Why is milk not, uh, have to be labeled? Again, animals are not genetically engineered. They do eat genetically engineered stuff, but another news flash is, in California, ballot initiatives can be about only one thing, okay? And while you may not be able to, um, uh, okay, so anyway, let me finish that thought. I, I, I jump here and there, sorry, that's another one of my things I forgot to mention. So anyway, so uh, something that eats genetically engineered foods is not the same thing that, uh, that is genetically engineered, okay? Do you see what I'm saying? It's, it's a different thing. So although ballot initiatives can't be amended, they can be sued, and you can be really sure that this one's gonna be challenged because they don't want us to know where the food is because historically around the world when the foods are labeled, guess what? People don't want them. Now, do we know if this country is gonna be the same way, if California is gonna be the same way? No, we don't know that, okay? But they're afraid or they wouldn't be fighting it. You know, Monsanto over in the UK has urged, you know, has, has an ad where they thought, they said yes, food should be genetically engineered, food should be labeled. This is a superior product. Well, of course we should advertise this. Well then, label it. And people who want to eat the genetically engineered stuff will be able to find it more. And they'll be able to buy more, okay? Pure and simple, that's all we're asking. Why won't you let us know what's in our food? Pet food is not included in the initiative. Um, let me see. Uh, the soy milk providers, the little tiny soy milk providers, Silk, uh, I'm sorry, Silk is not a small, they're owned by, what is it, Cargill, or who are they owned by? Tyson or Cargill, one of the five largest food companies on the planet. So, you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's not like, uh, anyway, and all, all anybody has to do, all anybody has to do in this is just say, the farmer says, I bought seed from somebody who told me that this was non-genetically engineered seed, okay? Then they plant the, 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 the plant. Then they sell it to the manufacturer. Then they give the manufacturer a thing that says, I bought this from somebody that said it wasn't genetically engineered, okay? Those people are covered, 
okay? They're covered, they don't have to worry about it. Uh, one of the other things that our opposition will say is, uh, you know, liken this to Prop 65. And it's a very, we have a whole paper with a legal brief about how it's different than Prop 65, which it has opened the door for frivolous lawsuits. We took very, very uh, uh, painstaking care to make sure that it, people could not easily sue for this. There is no financial incentive. Anybody who's caught with uh, violating their label, if they don't have the label on it, they have 30 days to rectify it, or they don't have, they don't have any penalties at all. I mean, give me a break. How easier could we make it? They are afraid. They are <laughs> misrepresenting quite a few stuff to ensure that we don't, that people get confused and they don't vote. So let's also talk about money. You know, they've got 25 million in their pack right now. We have like 4.2. I'm curious as to how many small donations under $50 they have. Mo much, much, much of our money came from small donations. Okay, and that's the people of California and actually around the country. Another thing that you're going to hear people, uh, our opposition say is, well, states shouldn't be deciding this. You know, the federal government should. You know, this is just California. They're the only people that want it. I can promise you because I'm in conversation with him, them. There are 19 states right now watching us. There are people who are volunteering to make phone calls for us because they're watching this and the minute this passes, and some of them are already in process. They're going to do the same thing we're doing in here because news flashes, the whole country wants this. Okay? And I am outraged that it took a grandmother from Chico with no experience, nothing, no funding, nothing to get this going. I mean, how ridiculous is that? And it was specifically because I was thinking about, you know, there has been, there have been attempts after attempts after attempts to get legislation and is constantly and continually shot down by heavy lobbyist interests. And I am tired of it. If people want to grow the stuff, great, grow it. Nobody's saying you can't continue your, uh, you know, your uh, uh, research. I, I question, though, the, 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 how, how important it is for the starving children of the world to have non-browning apples, because that's the other imp uh, big, important, feeding the world genetically engineered thing that's going to be on our plate, on our uh, market shelves next. Has it been a next? Anyway, thank you so much, and thank you guys for doing this. Great job. I am, as I said, uh, an educator, a mother, a consumer, and an agriculture advocate. I've been with the uh, agriculture groups since 95, and I've found that a lot of the things that I've learned are really important, and in a garden you can learn so much. I was even on the state uh, California school gardens um, development for the book, and I don't know if you have Gardens for Learning, but uh, if you have a chance, look up page 73, it's online, and you can hear my story about what happens when things go wrong in the garden. So, first of all, I'm here representing California Women for Agriculture. Um, it's an all-volunteer group of concerned California citizens who want to advocate and educate on the behalf of California farmers. We include bankers, farmers, both organic and conventional, legislators, educators, and consumers who want to inform California residents about California's number one industry. Do you guys realize that California feeds um, so much of, of the country and the world? Our laws and regulations for the California farmers are really high, and this feels like yet another thing. But I, as a mother, not a grandmother yet, <laughs> old enough, but not, I, I appreciate the right to know, because I, as American, want to know. Um, CWA wants to, to let you know their side of the story and why why we're against this. California Women for Agriculture support the development and incorporation of biotechnological tools in agriculture research and production. 
Biotech will give producers greater flexibility in making responsible management decisions by reducing input cost, increasing crop yields, promoting integrated pest management, producing environmental protections for our national um, natural resources, and facilitating the development of new products and processes. Biotechnology has a tremendous potential for positively affecting not only farmers, but also consumers by developing new products and opening new markets. These new products have the capability of improving health, solving vexing environmental problems, and decreasing world hunger. They also have the capability of enhancing the nutritional value of food, as you just talked about. Um, and protecting crops, animals, and humans from diseases and pests. CWA believes it is unnecessary, confusing, and costly to the consumer to label for biotech products or processes. Federal regulations require that food labels be truthful and not misleading, and prohibits label statements that could be misunderstood even if they are accurate. So that it was written by our pres state president, Carrie Hammerstrom, who happens to be um, a peach farmer. And she says, now when I sell my peaches, if I sell them whole, then I can sell them fine, but I have to label for some reason. And this is, this is the part I don't understand, and I may be misinformed, but I just, I know that she wouldn't be. She says that anything that's uh, gone through production, so if you chop up the peaches and you put them in a can, it's no longer eligible to be called natural. Um, now that goes a little further than where, yeah, you know what? I'd like you to not go that way for me, please. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just, it's really hard to be up here and have somebody looking at you and going, no, you're wrong. Um, because, you know what, I don't think so. I don't know everything. I don't know the ins and outs about what they're talking about exactly. But I do know that the people um, that I represent have tried to do the best they can, producing the best food for you that they can under the harshest restrictions that are available. So our food is usually far superior to anything else in the, in the world. Now, I think that it's really important to be able to label, but I don't like this law as it is written. I wanted to let you know that other, other times, things have been adjusted. There was a law that uh, they wanted to put forth on labeling to say this product was not made from cows treated with the BHT, I mean, hormones, growth hormones. Well, instantly took it upon themselves to include them, you can read it. Sometimes labels have sell-by dates. This one is September 15th. I purposely let this out of the refrigerator. Why? Because I have run into problems with some of the school cafeteria workers who say, oh, it's okay because it says September 15th. It's not past the due date. Oh, but I was growing up and I would smell my milk and if I could smell it and it made my stomach turn, I knew it was wrong. It wouldn't matter about this label. We're teaching our kids that if it's labeled okay, it's okay. And it's really not always okay. So we need to educate a little bit more than just that. I want to know what's genetic, genetically modified. I think that's really important. But I don't like the law. There's something I wanted to uh, read to you. I think I have another minute. Uh, three minutes. Three minutes? <laughs> OK, a student in 1997 in Idaho wanted to find out how people would vote on banning a chemical substance that had proven negative effects on almost everything in our environment. This chemical substance was a major component of acid rain, 
contributes to the greenhouse effect, can cause severe burns, is fatal if inhaled, contributes to the erosion of our natural landscape, and it decreases the effectiveness of automobile brakes. It's often used as industrial solvent, a fire retardant, in the production of styrofoam, and cannot be washed away. It could not be made clean by washing. It's an additive in a lot of junk foods. Well, I bet a lot of you already know about this study, and it was about dihydrogen monoxide, which is another way of saying water. So, I, as an informed citizen, would not like to ban water. Thank you very much. This is different than water, but I think we need to know a little bit more. I want the researchers to be researching both sides of it. That's really important to me. So I thank you. I hope that um, that answers a few questions, but it probably causes a lot more. <laughs> thank you so much for having this. I think it's very, very important, and I'm so glad that you're getting a chance to really see what government's like. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you all.